It all started in 1964, when a young English physicist named Peter Higgs suggested something about space that was so radical, it nearly ruined him. I was told that I was talking nonsense, that I couldn't be right. So they clearly hadn't understood what I, what I was saying. <laughs> Higgs and a few others were wrestling with a puzzle which comes down to this. The fundamental particles in the universe all contain different amounts of mass, which we usually think of as weight. Without mass, these particles would never combine to form the familiar atoms that make up all the stuff we see in the world around us. But what creates mass? And why do different particles have different masses? Try as they might, no one had been able to answer this perplexing question. Then one weekend, after a walk outside Edinburgh, Higgs had a peculiar idea. Using mathematics, he imagined space in a new way, as something like an ocean. Particles are immersed in this ocean and gain mass as they move through it. To see how this works, think of a particle's mass like an actor's fame. And the Higgs ocean is like the paparazzi. Some particles, like unknown actors, pass through with ease. The paparazzi simply aren't interested in them. But other particles, like superstars, have to push and press. And the more those particles struggle to get through, the more they interact with the ocean and the more mass they gain. Higgs was convinced he'd made a great discovery. But when he submitted his idea to a journal at CERN, it was rejected. Undaunted, Higgs honed his theory further until he was offered the chance to present it at Einstein's old haunt, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. There, he expected his new idea would meet some of its toughest critics. I was happily driving up the freeway, and then there was a sign to turn off for Princeton, and that really confronted me with what I was going into. I broke out in a cold sweat and, uh, and started trembling, and I had to uh, pull off the road to recover. But Higgs persevered. It was the first in a series of talks that would convince colleagues far and wide that he was onto something profound. Eventually, I, I sort of wore them down. I felt I sort of triumphed. <laughs> so I enjoyed the parties which followed. Today, the idea Higgs pioneered, called the Higgs field, is crucial to our understanding of space. The Higgs field is everywhere. It's something that even in the emptiest vacuum of space has an effect. It gives you mass. So I think Higgs actually deserves credit for being one of the people that said, space is stuff. It has properties in it that are intrinsic, that you can't get rid of. You can't turn them off. The only problem? There's no physical proof that the Higgs field exists, at least not yet. But here at CERN, scientists are attempting to smash particles together with so much energy that they will knock loose a piece of the Higgs field, producing a tiny particle of its own. It's as if they're trying to chip off a piece of space. We think that if we knock into space hard enough with particle accelerator collisions that we can actually make a Higgs particle come out of empty space. Our whole understanding of matter as we now have it would just fall apart if the Higgs field didn't exist. I don't think anybody seriously doubts that we will see it. Certainly if we don't, that would be an extremely bizarre outcome. Finding the Higgs particle would be a major milestone establishing that the emptiest of empty space has an impact on all of matter. If you really want to understand how the universe ticks, the LHC is what you need. We're about to go back to the beginning of time. The time when the Higgs ruled the universe. It will change our understanding of the cosmos. We 
want to know why things are the way they are. I want to know how they work, what everything is. What is mass? Why does it exist? Particles acquire mass by interacting with the Higgs field. The Higgs mechanism works by filling the universe with the field. If you're going to go for the big questions, then you have to go for it. That's what science at the Large Hadron Collider is all about. We can stare at the face of creation, smash, ratter together, at energies never before achieved. We can stare at the face of creation, a beam of protons going that way, at almost the speed of light. Another beam of protons going that way, at almost the speed of light. They'll cross inside Atlas, and recreate the conditions that were present. Just after the beginning of the universe We can stare at the face of creation Smash, matter together At energies never before achieved We're about to go back to the beginning of time When the Large Hadron Collider and its massive detectors become operational in 2007, one of its primary tasks will be to look for the Higgs boson. Although formulated by several theorists, it takes its name from one of its proponents, Professor Peter Higgs of Edinburgh University, who today leads a quiet life in an old area of Edinburgh known as Newtown. As he walks each day near his home, this leading field theorist passes the house of a revered predecessor. This house we're standing outside is the, the birthplace of James Clerk Maxwell. It's a reminder to me of the, the way field theory began in the 19th century. As a pupil of Cotton School in Bristol, he excelled in mathematics. And then he became aware of a famous old boy of the school, the theoretical physicist Paul Dirac. The name Paul Dirac appeared rather frequently in the, the school honours board at the back of the platform in the assembly hall. So I got curious about what Paul Dirac did. <laughs> it, it very soon became evident when I was a physics undergraduate that I was not going to be an experimental physicist. Uh, I was terrible as an experimentalist. At King's College London, where I was an undergraduate, they'd introduced a theoretical option. Uh, so uh, I, I gladly took that. <laughs> and it was as a theoretical physicist that Peter Higgs encountered theories by the Japanese-American physicist Yoshiro Nambu that seemed to point the way to understanding particle masses. In the version of the, this type of theory which, <clears throat> which I formulated in 1964, which uh, brought in uh, fields like Maxwell's electromagnetism, fields of this type, uh, in addition to giving mass to the fermions, the uh, quanta of the electromagnetic type of field acquired mass too. This is what has been given the name the Higgs mechanism, though it was actually uh, written down a little earlier by <coughs> uh, Brout and Onglair in Brussels. And the generation of mass there is, is the, uh, the same kind of thing as uh, in Nambu's uh, papers, but it, no, it is now uh, working for uh, particles of spin one, which are the quanta of the electromagnetic type of field. They change from being particles which travel with the velocity of light two particles which travel with anything less than the velocity of light, and that's the massiveness. Much of these new ideas center on the rethinking of the nature of a vacuum. When you look at the vacuum in a quantum theory of fields, it isn't exactly nothing. The, it, the vacuum state is the state of lowest possible energy and again, as in the original classical idea, it's what you have left when you pump everything you can out of your system. Now, everything you can pump out is all the particles, but you don't necessarily get rid of everything. There can be uh, residual fields which remain as a background in this vacuum. So the vacuum is no longer 
quite as empty as it used to be. It's the interaction between this field, now known as the Higgs field, and particles that's at the centre of his thinking. The relation to particles is that in these theories, the, uh, this background uh, could be deformable. It could be excited by interaction with other things. Uh, the excitations take the form classically of, of travelling waves and so on. But this is quantum mechanics, not classical mechanics. Every time you have uh, travelling waves, uh, the energy and momentum come in lumps. And in the case of the Higgs field, these lumps are the Higgs bosons that the LHC is preparing to look for. What's intriguing about these Higgs bosons and their source field is that they appear to confer mass on particles. The way that the background field generates mass is rather like the way in which when light passes through a transparent medium like glass or water, it gets slowed down. It no longer travels with the fundamental velocity of light, C. And that's the way to think, think of the generation of, of mass because in, in a, a quantum field theory, all the other particles are also excitations of various kinds of fields, which you can describe by classical waves. Now, these waves travel through this background field, and the way they travel in terms of the relation between frequency and, and wavelength is altered by the background field, or may be altered. If they interact with the background field, it alters the so-called dispersion relation between frequency and wavelength. Now, when it comes to the particles, which are the uh, associated with those other fields, uh, you, you, you take the uh, frequency multiplied by Planck's constant, you take the inverse of the wavelength multiplied by Planck's constant, the one gives you the energy of a particle, the other gives you the momentum of a particle. And so altering the frequency wavelength relation of the waves propagating through the Higgs field alters the uh, energy momentum relation for the particles and therefore alters the mass. The problem is explaining the considerable variation of mass between different particles. In theories of this type, most of that variation is attributed to variation in the strength of the interaction of, of the particles with the Higgs field. Now, that's not really a, a, any explanation. It's, it's simply saying there is a connection between uh, the mass that the particle has and the extent to which it inter interacts with the Higgs field. The LHC's detectors will look for hard evidence that it is these interactions with the Higgs field carried by Higgs bosons that are responsible for mass. As a theoretician, of course, I, 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 I find the, uh, the mathematical structure of this kind of, of theory uh, very satisfying. Uh, but on the other hand, if it's not verified experimentally, it, well, it's just a game. It, ha it, it has to be put to the test. Uh, at the present time, the interesting thing is that the uh, electroweak theory of Glashow, Weinberg and Salam, which was the successful application of these ideas, has been r r rather th thoroughly tested uh, quantitatively, for, for most of the relationships that, that, that are built into it, in, in the course particularly of the running of LEP. Now, given that th that has been done, uh, it would be r rather surprising to me if the underlying idea was, was not right. If the Higgs boson exists, the LHC will have the power to detect it. That's assuming the theory is correct. The theory fits the data in a crude way to about 10% accuracy if you, if you just do a, what's almost a back-of-the-envelope calculation from the original equations. But then you have to do corrections to this first approximation. And into the corrections, the so-called one-loop corrections come the masses of all the particles 
that are in the theory that maybe you haven't yet discovered. Now, during the, the running of LEP, they pinned down the masses of everything, I think, except the top quark. In 1995, Fermilab found the top quark and produced a, a, an a, a approximate mass for it, and that enabled people to look at this correction formula and say, okay, what's, what's left to fill the gap between theory and experiment? Uh, that's the Higgs boson contribution. Therefore, the Higgs boson mass should be in a certain range. Uh, in 1995, the pr prediction was a rather interesting one. It was that the most likely values were within reach of LEP, uh, around about uh, en energy 95 or 90 or so uh, Jev, and LEP went up beyond that. Uh, LEP went up to 114 and didn't find anything. And this was maybe a bit worrying because uh, they were beginning to get to the tail of the st statistical distribution. Uh, but in the last few months, uh, new measurements uh, reported by Fermilab have revised the mass of the top quark and that favoured value, the most, most likely value for the Higgs boson mass, is about 117. Now, that's tantalisingly close to what the people at LEP thought they might have found. It would certainly be very puzzling for, for, for me to, to, to think of a situation where somebody could really r rule out the existence of the Higgs, Higgs boson because uh, there, there it is. It's, I mean, it, well, there it is. The, the, the theory and the experiment are working very well to, together in all other respects. So where do you go from there? <laughs> well, I would like to add my congratulations to everybody involved in this tremendous achievement. Uh, for me, it's really an incredible thing that it's happened in my lifetime. <laughs> it's taken... <laughs> it's ta Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is a great honour for François Anglaire and me to receive the Nobel Prize in Physics, and we wish to express our sincere gratitude to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and the Nobel Foundation. It is a matter of great regret for both of us that Robert Brout did not live to share the prize with us. The fact that it has been awarded to just the two of us implicitly recognizes his contribution as his right. However, it should be remembered that the three of us were not the only theorists who contributed to the elucidation of what is now called the BEH mechanism about 50 years ago. The long time gap between the theoretical work and the award of the prize is largely a consequence of the difficulty of performing the experiments needed to detect the new particle that is an essential feature of our theory. More than 30 years of work on the development of accelerators, detectors, and computer programs have culminated in the discovery claim made by CERN in July 2012. It was a great achievement by all the people involved, and we are grateful to them for enabling us to be here today.